All right, everybody hear me in the back? Am I on on here? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, t a typical phrase around our farm is, or not our farm, but in our community might be in yours is from the old time farmers, the, can't get no help. <laughs> if I could just get some help on the farm, we'd be all right. Um, how do you get energetic, how do you get and keep energetic workers on the farm? Um, that are great team players. Um, we have been, I'll just say that we have been truly blessed by the team players that we've had on our farm um, over the years. And 99% um, and, and of them have just been wonderful stars and have gone on to be bigger stars. And we just are so proud of them, uh, Pete being one of them. And um, so we have, we, uh, they've really become part of the family after, after a period of time there. Um, a basic overview of, of just a little bit of credentials, if you will, of why, of why I would be speaking on this as a 30-year-old uh, young farmer at this point. Why is this guy talking about keeping labor? Um, we started the intern pro, uh, apprentice program. I'm a, uh, for polyface, I'm going to use these couple terms. I'll give you, let me give you a glossary here. <laughs> uh, for us, intern means four months, June through September. Okay. Um, and we have uh, eight to nine of those annually, and we've been doing that. This will be coming our fifth uh, year on that. Um, and uh, from my met, this is my wife Sherry. She's going to be keeping me straight if I get too too wayward here today. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we do that. Then apprenticeship or apprentice is a year uh, commitment, and we typically have two of those at a time. Um, we have employees, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we keep them as long as we can and uh, pick the best of the best. We have seven of those uh, for anything from full-time to a couple days a week. Uh, some off-farm, some on-farm. Uh, we can delve more into that if time allows, but we have seven uh, people on the payroll employees. In addition to Salatin family, which we're also on the payroll as employees uh, through the company. Again, how all that works with taxes is another session, so we'll leave that alone. Um, and then we have three subcontractors, and I, we call subcontractors because they are people that are managing. Uh, we rent about five. Um, well, we have six. We work with six landlords that we rent property from, and um, these three subcontractors are managing uh, some of the farms and property um, that we that we currently lease. Uh, the one prerequisite uh, there, if you want to asterisk the subcontractor, you can't be a subcontractor without being an intern or apprentice first. So that's kind of the prerequisite for that. Um, we have been doing internships and apprenticeships. Well, we started with apprenticeships, just one a year. Um, so that's where we are now, okay? Put that on a shelf and say, all right, um, we didn't start that way at all. We started the apprenticeship program over 15 years ago in the mid-90s and um, have been uh, working with it ever since. And it has grown now to the point that I just mentioned of our, of our numbers at the moment. Um, so I started being a boss at 15, which was really great. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. Uh, to, you know, uh, learned a lot about working with people and, um, you know, communication and whatnot. So uh, it was a very good learning experience for me at that age um, and, and humbling as well at many times. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. We started with two apprentice, apprentices or one apprentice. And certainly at that point, we took, you know, who we could find. We, we you know, searched and, and whoever came to the, the farm, we pretty much accepted whoever uh, was coming along that, that would work well and, and do good for us. But today my goal is to give you, um, well, let me ask this, who currently, does anyone have interns and apprentices on their farm currently? Okay, pretty good, pretty good chunk. Um, and employees, employees, okay, all about the same number, a little more. Um, and then I'm assuming all of the rest of us are either wanting to be apprentices or interns or wanting to get apprentices and interns or you wouldn't be here. Um, what I'd like to do is mainly what I mean. The reason I asked that question was to focus the fact that we don't have uh, too many people here that are are, are looking for jobs uh, at the moment and to become interns and apprentices. If you were in here, I'd get, it'd be a pretty good leg up on how to to land the job, if you will. Um, but what we're going to be looking at is a the, how are are you as a farmer manager ready 
for interns and apprentices. Um, and, and have the skills necessary. I just want to throw some things out there, skills necessary to effectively run an intern and apprentice program. Um, and, and do we have the skills necessary? Because I know at 15 years old, I certainly didn't. Um, there were things at that point my dad certainly didn't. And we have grown into that role over the last you know, 15 to 20 years, um, learning from a lot of different places and from the School of Hard Knocks as well. Um, then, and then also, I will go through exactly uh, where we find them, how we get them, the selection process, and then all the way down to the, you know, what we pay them, how we work the housing, the whole gamut. Okay? That's kind of where we're headed today. All right? Um, so let's start with what we need. All right? We're the bosses. We're the farm owners, managers, whatever. What are some of the things that we need to be able to, ha to, to handle this? Um, and I bring some of these up because these are very common uh, team leading skills in any other field of, of business, um, from you know accounting to uh, CEOs to whatever. But in farmers' times, it gets overlooked, and so I want to bring them up. Probably a lot of you have a lot of these skills, but I just want to bring them up because they're they're really key. Um, obviously, the first one is clear communication. You have to like people. You have to be able to like to talk to people, um, and you have and you have to be able to. Uh, to communicate what's gonna, what the vision for the day is, what the vision for the farm is, what the vision of, uh, you know, uh, this week is, this ta given task. Um, you know, we can't expect them to know what you're thinking or read your mind. I mean, this is very much like a, uh, a serious relationship here. <laughs> you look at it and say, why didn't you do this? Well, you never told me. Um, and so we have to be able to be clear communicators. Um, another one, and this is a tough one for farmers, myself included, is clear delegation. We have to be free to let them dele to delegate responsibility um, to your interns and apprentices so that they own things. And I don't say own it uh, monetarily. I mean own it emotionally. They need to have the knowledge that you are trusting them. And I'm not talking about day one, but you have to be comfortable of letting go of projects or letting go of tasks to allow the apprentice or intern to feel comfortable with the trust that you can bond, that you can work together, and I'm not again. I I just realized that that's not week one. Don't crucify me yet, but it's an important understanding that for an successful apprenticeship program, that you need to be able to down the road delegate tasks, and it's as simple as opening the chicken house in the morning to let the birds out, to going and raking the hay. Whatever the the skill level of that apprentice or intern happens to be, you have to be willing. To let those jobs go and, and whatever and and do it, um, we need to be a clear goal setter. Um, nothing is worse or, or more inefficient than a a nebulous plan. Just kind of well, we're gonna get up tomorrow and we'll do something, you know, whatever that happens to be. We'll see what's going. On. You have to be able to have clear goals, whether it be daily, weekly, annually. We need to be able to move forward in a clear uh, set. Um, uh, regimen there. Um, and this kind of rolls in the second one, daily and yearly planning. Um, you can have the goal of raising clean food, so we have to have a clean, a clear definition of where we're going, but then at the same time we need to be able to plan the steps that we need to get to this goal. A goal plan and a vision, what's the difference between a goal plan and a vision? Those three? I would say goal and vision would be the same, in my opinion. That's just, I've used different terms. Um, but the daily and yearly planning would be different from goal. That would be the daily steps that you need to reach the goal. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Um, and uh, I use uh, daily and yearly planning um, differently than uh, the next step, which is daily sequencing and flow. Okay, number one project, this project has to happen before that project. You know, we need to hook up the tractor to the log trailer before we can go get the logs. Okay, I mean, sometimes it has to be that broken down, right? Okay, um, we have to get through. We have to get through the thing. So the daily sequencing. Okay, we have to feed the pigs before we can go out and make the hay because then the pigs are hungry. Okay, that sequencing is very important. Um, you have to be enjoy teaching. Okay, because you have to really enjoy. Ex Bounding on and sharing knowledge. So being a teacher is very, very important. If you're kind of a stand back and, and quiet, reserved type person and leave me alone, uh, you know, the apprenticeship program might not be for you. Um, 
uh, two more, and we have a, a changing gears here. Uh, number one, number, I don't know where we are here, thick skin. <laughs> got to be able to laugh at yourself. You got to be able to poke fun at yourself. Have to realize you're not perfect. Realize that you make mistakes. And believe me, nothing will bring out inconsistencies in your life or in your farming practices than a young person that's never been there before and will ask all sorts of questions about why you do this and why you do that. Because they will be asking you all of those, which rolls right into the last one is, you have to be prepared for a transparent life. You will be now living in a fishbowl. <laughs> Everything that you do will be questioned if you have an intern and apprenticeship program. Um, I might could have asked this earlier, but it's really clear that you set a goal for the program. Um, what do you want to accomplish out of this intern program? Is it mainly work? Then you don't have to have some of these skill sets, okay? You don't have to go to, you don't have to be living in a glass house. They can show up eight to five, leave, you go back to your family, game over, okay? Uh, what is the exact tasks that you want them to accomplish? And then the end goal, do you want them to be farmers at the end of this? on their own? Do you want them to work with you forever? Do you want them to have education that then they can go on and learn other things? I know I'm throwing things out kind of popcorn at you, but there are a lot of factors that are involved in saying, oh yeah, we just let's just get an intern. We'll just throw an ad up here on the PASA board and somebody will give me a call. They'll be great. They'll come for five months and then they'll leave. It'll be fantastic. Then I'll have all this extra time to do all these projects I've wanted to do. The other thing about this is an intern program is the illusion of free help. Let me just address this one right up front. <laughs> All right, a lot of us in the room, I could put my hand down because I didn't, went to college, right? They didn't just give that to you, I don't think. Most, some of us probably are still paying off student loans <laughs> on that wonderful college education. Education's expensive. Okay, education is very expensive and we have to address that. And so the idea that you can take, and so if you're doing, you know, set employee aside, employee is supposed to make you money. So that's a different story. But when you're talking about a teaching education intern or apprenticeship program, education is very expensive. So unless your person is paying you to keep them, you can plan on spending money on them. And whether that goes to housing, whether it goes to broken hitches on the tractor, whether it goes to wasted time getting the cows in because they were in the wrong spot and chased them over the back 40, whether it means you pull the truck out of the ditch, whatever it means, it costs you money. Dad wants to write another book and it's called apprenticeship and the title is going to be Oops. <laughs> all, a lot of time my phone rings, my phone rings and it all starts out like this. Uh, so Daniel, I'm like, oh dear. <laughs> Oh no, what's next? You know, it's well, so the four wheeler has four wheels, right? I'm like, uh huh. I'm like, well, one is not there anymore. <sighs> Daniel, the truck has four wheels and they're all supposed to be on the ground, but they're not. <sighs> we had the hay all loaded up on the wagon, but then we came down the hill and it's. Not on the wagon anymore. Yeah, okay. You get the idea. <laughs> That's a lot of my phone calls. So, job security, right? Um, I, en I, enjoy, I enjoy the intern program. I've really, I really love working with, I say young people. It started out, some of my best friends are past apprentices. Um, the best man in my wedding was an apprentice, and I was best man in his wedding. We just have really bonded relationships when you work together for a year. You work closely because farming is a lifestyle, not so much a job. I mean, you know, the cows get out not 8 to 5, right? <laughs> it's usually at like 5.30 when the employees just drove out the door, and you're going, oh, no, I'm here by myself. And so the internship program needs to be an immersion. It needs to be a full-on, all-the-time life experience. We call it... Our internship program we call a summer life experience, okay, farm experience. We say spend a summer with us and leave years ahead. That's the motto of the summer intern program. You're going to learn pastured poultry. You're going to learn um, the, uh, the, for ours it's pretty much education um, and, and, and working. So that's, that's what we go after and, and kind of our goals for the internship program. 
And um, so we have, a, uh, we have a pretty consistent and a clear goal of where we want to go with these guys. And if they end up, guys and girls, excuse me, and we have um, whether they end up being employees at the end or whether they roll into subcontracting or whether they go home to Pennsylvania and, oh, Pete's left, um, and start farming on their own um, and have a successful farm business that way, that doesn't make any difference to us. I mean, it's kind of a, we start with the apprenticeship pro or the internship program and we roll from there. Um, it, it really is a, a great experience and they, they really are close family members. We just had, we've had um, four weddings out of uh, the apprenticeship and intern program. Um, two of which to my sister-in-laws, and uh, Sherry's out of sisters, guys, so tough luck. And uh, <laughs> so we've had, had a good experience with all that and, and good, good family as well. Um, so if you're going to make this about education, we can't just say, man, we have all this work to do, and so we just need an intern to help us. Because at the same time, you have to be able to have enough exciting, new, innovative things to teach. It can't just be a summer work project because believe me that won't last very long in an intern program. That'll get very very short-lived in a hurry. You have to be doing new stuff. Um, again, a lot of this can be set up in your ad so that they know what's going on. I mean if you gotta get all your cards on the table. If you want somebody to work on the farm and just be a hand, okay you might be able to find somebody. But don't call it an intern program call it a, a summer help hand program or something, okay? Because you have to be clear about what you're wanting people to do. And if it's an intern program, it needs to be about education because that's what the kind of general uh, consensus is what those are. And so you need to be able to have something to teach. Um, I think a lot of this is we have, as farmers, goes back to those few things that we have to look about ourselves in the mirror about our leadership role is are we really ready for interns? I run into a lot of farming situations, including some of our own, where we say, boy, if we just got somebody here to help us, we'd get this straightened out. When in fact, we're just not being very good time managers, or we're not being very effective ourselves, or we haven't crunched the numbers on it, and actually we need to hire somebody for it, or maybe we need to do away with the plan and the program altogether. So as farmers, we really have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, do we in fact truly need an intern? Because we figure our interns cost us anywhere from three to $5,000 for the four months. That's what comes out of our pocket to, for room, board, housing, and other oopsies. <laughs> um, and that's a ballpark figure. I mean, that's very, pretty much we don't do anything less than four months because the first month they're just learning where the hammer is. <laughs> they're just trying to keep up with everything. The second month they're trying to learn all the ter terminologies and really get up to speed on everything. And the second two months, they actually make you a little bit of money. Okay, so anything less than four months, we feel like is pretty much a, 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 just a drain on the business if it's if that's what it's all about. Um, so uh, we we try to have at least a four month uh, commitment so that we can at least get our money back on what we've put into the education. Um, we uh, we know how many times that people come and um, we have requests all the time. Oh, I'll just follow you around for a couple days, I won't get in your way, I'll be a complete help. <laughs> we don't do that. And we, and I'm sure some of you are smiling, so you know what I'm talking about, but you would not believe how hard it is to make someone understand that they cannot possibly, as willing and as eager and as energetic as they are, work enough to not slow you down and cost you money for three days of tagging along. They just can't. It's impossible. I can't. I know I can't. So I don't ask anybody to tag along. But, but oh yeah, so we don't do anything short term. It's just a drain on the company and your business. You gotta have a long term commitment at least of four months in our opinion um, for, th for education to be transferred. Um, okay, so that's kind of how we attack the intern and apprenticeship program. This year we're actually not even accepting apprentices. They actually have to do internship and then become apprentices. The apprentices are going to be more of a paid position this next year. Um, so uh, they're going to get anywhere from um, $500 to $1,500 a month depending on their capabilities and skills in that second 12, in that next 12 months. So I know some of you are like, whoa, that's a lot. Well, 
we found that good people pay for themselves. The problem is you need enough time to find out if they're good people. So we started as an intern. They get under the $600 stipend, so you don't have to report them to FICA and get them under workman's comp and all that, just casual labor. I think that's a pretty universal law. Um, what's that? Suppose they get hurt. They, at that point, they're under an education type deal. So just like you're at college, you have your own insurance. That's a good question. Like if there's any injury or whatnot, um, that they have, they are on our workman's comp, but they're not on our health insurance at that point. So it's just like a college situation. The college is not liable for you, you know, uh, partying and falling off a balcony. <laughs> but we're same thing here. We we cover any liable things. You know, if you cut your finger butchering chickens, um, a lot of our st our workman's comp will help you get that taken care of. But we're not. You're not on our health insurance at all. Um, do you require them to have their own? Insurance? Do we require them to have their own insurance? No, we do not. No, that's up to you. I mean, I talk about that plane. Pete said that Pete's here has the, has had the worst accident on Polyface history ever. Uh, we just had a little piece of equipment, or not little piece of equipment, a, lar a larger piece of equipment uh, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, and tumble down and hurt my knee and break his leg, and that's the worst a accident we've ever had. A uh, few stitches up here, and so anyway, scary at the moment, but fortunately, everybody worked out okay. And he didn't have very good insurance, <laughs> so we, we worked out things. But no, we don't require anyone to have insurance, uh, but it's your responsibility. Most of these, ki most of these kids um, are young enough, they're still on their parents' um, plan of some sort, okay? Um, we don't take, that's a good question in, in leading into the fact that we don't take anybody under 18 years of age just because of uh, child labor laws and things like that, even though they're not getting paid um, to the point of reporting and all that, it's just simpler if they're 18 years old at least. Uh, we don't have an upper age limit. If you can do the work and you're accepted, you can come. Um, but we don't. We have the underage. Yes. Talking about apprentices right now. I'm talking about internship. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so interns, are paid. interns get a. Uh, I think it's a $400. It's a hundred dollar a month stipend. Um, for their time there, which again is under the tax law and gives them something to, you know, buy <laughs> peanut butter and jelly and <laughs> whatever else or toilet, uh, toilet paper or whatever else they need out there in their, in their housing. Um, I'll get into actual compensation in just a minute, but, but that's, that's, a, that's a fair question at the moment. Um, okay, so how do you find these guys? Uh, we have been, again, blessed with great, great apprentices and interns. Um, based on the amount of horror stories that we've heard from other people, programs, we have a very, very small list compared to most people's very large list. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because we have a very stringent application process, which is what I'm now going to share with you. Um, the way we find our team, again, at the beginning, we did it through um, publications, we put out advertisements, we did, I mean, of course, my dad was already speaking at that point, so we asked for people to apply. Um, at this point in time, we use our website, um, social media, Facebook. One of the great places to start off in a small farm to look at your first um, in, uh, in interns is actually customers. Um, throw it out to your customers and see if any of them are interested in being involved in this, you know, world-changing food exercise. And that's a great place for, you know, when, when that's a common question is come up, oh, well, you guys wrote all these books. You have these websites. You're all over the country lecturing. You get people all, all over the place. And we do. I'm not going to lie. I mean, we in a two-week period in August when we opened it up on the website, we had 90 applicants. Um, but how do you start off? And one of the common answers I say is go to customers. If you have any customers at all, start there. They might not be long-term. You might have to settle for something shorter than the four months or something, but those people are typically buying into you as an individual. They have your farm already on their mind and, and already interested in your success, and some of them might be interested in getting more involved or earning some free meat or vegetables or whatever. And so you can kind of do something there uh, to get them involved. And that's I think, is a great place to get started is your customer base. Um, I mean, there's networking sites. The wall upstairs is covered with people looking for, for interns and whatnot. Um, so the way we actually run our acceptance and, and application process is on our website, we have um, a special email set up. It's futurefarmer.com and uh, futurefarmer, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, and uh, so they can email the special email address. 
and we open it up for two weeks in August. Um, and we, we start way in advance. You don't have to be this far in advance, but that's obviously starting for the following season's interns. Okay, so we're almost a year in advance as far as their application process goes. Um, at that point, we're looking for a letter of interest and intent. Um, just an email that says, hey, I'm Jane Smith. I'm really excited about food and farming. I love your farm, and I'd like to come and, and be an intern. Great. We send out an application. The application is a, about an 8 to 10 question application. Remember, you have to read all of these applications, so fewer questions is better. <laughs> we have even the top says, be brief, please. After 90 applications, you're about done, let me tell you. So uh, questions can range. You can come up with your own. Some of ours are, you know, why do you want to come? Uh, where do you see yourself in 10 years? For us, we have how do you feel about killing animals? Uh, <laughs> vegetable producers can leave that one off, whatever. Um, what's the hardest job you've ever done and why? Trying to get into their heads whether they think that hard manual labor is tough, whether they think, um, whether they think mental work is harder. Uh, some of them, you know, there's lots of answers. Some of them will say college was the hardest job I ever did. I hated books, you know, it was hard for me to study and all that. That's a great answer. It's not a wrong answer. It's just a great, uh, an, there's no wrong answers to these questions. It just gives you a good insight into what the person is about. Um, if you have uh, faith or uh, religion um, issues, you can put some of those questions on. Uh, we typically, one of our questions is a two-parter, a two and we say, um, how do you feel about, you know, liberal tree-hugging, um, you know, environmentalists, okay? And they write out a little essay about how they feel about those people. And then you have over here, uh, question number 10 is, how do you feel about Christian, libertarian, conservative, homeschool people? And they fill in about that. And it doesn't mean, and, and it, yeah, those are terms and phrases, and we get a lot of answers like, well, I don't like putting people in a box, and I, I try to get along with everybody, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But, you know, if what, what we're trying to get in there is, is, is someone a, a blazing freak out, you know, NRA Republican, oh, I can't possibly work with a dreadlock liberal wacko, that's impossible, you know, and we'll get those kind of answers. Usually those people aren't accepted, but, you know, whatever. We're trying to weed the chaff, okay, the wheat from the chaff. It's all a sifting, sifting idea, okay? But you could put any of those questions on there. That, that's up to you. But there's are a couple that we use. Yes? Is your application available online to look at, or is it only from mm -mm. the people who keep it? No, I don't. I don't. We don't. We have, there's a couple things here. There's, there's a couple of things that I have here today that I don't, we don't publicize just because there's very specific polyface oriented stuff on it. Um, so I'm going to give you a lot of basics and, and um, generalizations. But I'm, like, I have right here the uh, Polyface hand, Apprentice Handbook for Success. A uh, lot of people have asked us to buy this and to, to buy that. I'm not going to sell it to you for any money at all, ever. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's a lot of a very specific polyface stuff that we, we keep. But we do give it to all the people that are accepted. They get a copy of this handbook. <laughs> and all the apprentices look through it and laugh and be like, wow, I was dumb back then. <laughs> That's right. Both, both. Interns, apprentices, employees, any staff members. I read it from time to time just to tone up on my own skills. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we're back to the application process. So we get the applications. We get... Like I say, we get about 90 applications. We read through the applications. Um, and this is, for us, we, use, we agree on how we're going to select this. Sherry organizes it. Um, we have a nice flow chart of the person's name and where they're from and if they're married or single and if they want to be an apprentice down the road. And um, then we have place for comments and what's an age. Yeah, just little things like that. She keeps all this out on a spreadsheet for us. And we read the applications Put our grade down on them. We've usually just kind of use a 1 to 100 kind of first grade. And then we all sit together, all meaning Sherry, myself, and my mom, and my dad, and we go over it. Um, any, any one of us have complete veto power um, over the other three. If we just absolutely factually can't stand this person, we have veto power. But we also work off of, a, um, off of three is a winner as well. So if, if you don't have strong oh, I cannot stand this person, um, then we, uh, we go ahead. Um, so let's see. We go through the application process. We weed it down to about uh, 30. We send them emails saying you've made the first cut. You've, you're welcome to, uh, congratulations, you've made it through the first 
uh, gap there. Um, and the next step is for a two-day on-farm checkout. And this is where it really separates the boys from the men, let me tell you. And it really separates the committed from the non-committed. This is a Gideon test, let me tell you. Because if they're willing to get on a plane, train, bus, or automobile and get to Polyface from wherever they are, and they know this coming in, it, it requires it on the website. You can go to our website and see all these requirements um, out in the public. <laughs> um, and they have to come for a checkout. I tell you what, an in-person checkout is the most number one thing you can do ever. Not only, and we call it a checkout, not of us to them, it's also for them to us. It's a two-day checkout, not just from the top down, it's from them, because they need to be comfortable with living with us crazy people. <laughs> That's the biggest part. Farm, we're crazy people. We live this stuff all the time. We enjoy manure and earthworms and crazy stuff and, and going out at midnight checking on predators and, and checking on chicks and all this stuff. I mean, we're crazy. They got to know that we're, this is what it's all about. Um, so they have to come. If they don't come, they're automatically out. So the, this is uh, the application process is in August. We usually get around to reading all the applications by like the 1st of October. And then we have um, the two-day checkout is in January. We give them like a three-week window. They have to come in two days out of the, any of those three weeks. Okay? Um, in the dead of winter. Yeah, exactly. In the dead of winter. And then we line up really exciting jobs like hauling firewood and shoveling brush and, and so all sorts of exciting things like that. Um, light hand, many hands make light work type work. Um, now, and then everyone, and then we evaluate as a complete staff, current apprentices, and also the family members that I mentioned. Um, we have another flow chart, <laughs> and Sherry keeps us up to date on. And um, we evaluate them on the, basically the nine things that are in this handbook. Um, and I've, I've seen these, uh, these things being, the, these checkouts being very short. I know of a guy, it's a, two, it's a two part test. He doesn't tell this very often, but anyway, the applicant comes in, says, hey, he's a, when, the, when the applicant walks in, he's moving boxes from a pallet to a shelf. The applicant comes in, hey, Kyle, nice to meet you, good to see you, yeah, welcome. I've got a phone call, I'll be right back. Steps around the corner, waits about five minutes, comes back around. If Kyle's not moving the boxes from the pallet to the shelf, he says, well, thank you for coming, the interview is over, we'll be talking to you later. That's it, and they're out. Um, if Kyle passes that, he will say, all right, well, that's great. We'll come back and finish this later. Let's go into our office and chat for a little bit. As he turns, he flicks a piece of tissue paper out on the ground, fairly large, like a hand, you know, handkerchief or something, throws it out on the ground as he turns around and continues walking. If Kyle doesn't see this, let's bend over and pick up this piece of trash. He turns around and says, thank you, Kyle. We appreciate you for your time. We'll see you later. <laughs> and that's the end of the interview process. If you want to be that extreme, you can. I don't know. It doesn't take us, I mean, we've been doing it a long time. It doesn't take us that long to find out if somebody's a winner or not. People have a winner and attitude right away. But things that we look at to evaluate, uh, number one is service. Um, we have in the handbook here, the first primary attitude is service. This means you are always thinking about how to make the other person's job easy. It doesn't matter whether you were told to do something specifically. If you see something that needs done, do it. What I mean, an well, example of this is if you drive the four-wheeler, and come in, don't leave the tools and the wire and the stakes and stuff left on the four-wheel that you needed for your job. It needs to be cleaned off, empty, ready to go, so that when the next guy hops on it, it's empty and ready for his job. Service. Uh, this goes as far as, you know, at dinner time, they eat with us during this checkout, and this goes as far as we, like, we observe who jumps up at the end of dinner and clears the table and takes it over and helps wash dishes, and I mean, the whole gamut. They've got to be involved, engaged, service-oriented. Okay, um, we want it to do it our way first. If I back up to the track, if I back up the tractor one direction, and they're like, "Oh, just come around that way," mm -mm, no, no, you're going to do it the way I do it first. It might be wrong, but you don't know all the ins and outs yet, so you need to wait and see what what happens next. Um, number three is right time for questions. Um, there is, you know, <laughs> the classic one, you know, questions. You know, we're bringing in 500 head of cattle down the path, you know, and they're running in the corral, and we're standing there, and we're obviously, cattle handling is the hardest thing to teach because it's 
big time movement. You never know what's going to happen. And you're watching all the different animals. And after a lifetime, you see the differences. And, um, you know, we're sitting there doing that. And then all of a sudden, the, uh, you know, checkout leans over and goes, um, so what did you put in that mineral box over there? Really? We're putting the cows in the corral. That's not the time to ask about the minerals in the cows. This is time to focus on, are the cows going into the corral properly? Are they going to get out somewhere? There's a lot of things involved there. And so um, the, uh, those right time and appropriate for questions. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the handbook, Dad says, uh, uh, we're creative. Oh, no, that's the next one. We're talking... Um, is, is number two is, is or no, number four now is put it back. <laughs> Poly, Polyface thrives on creativity and innovation, but when it comes to putting tools away, we're not interested in creativity about where to put the hammer. <laughs> yeah, so easy. You know, just when you get something back, put it back. Um, five is situation awareness. Um, this is obviously the hardest, but um, one of the most common questions that I'll ask interns is, didn't you see this? You know, when you walked through the hoop house and you stepped over the dead bird, did you not see the dead bird to pick up and clean up as opposed to me taking a tour of school children around and being like, oh, there's the dead bird. Of course, the kids always see the dead bird. And I'm like, what's up with that one? And you're going, I didn't see anything. And so you're having to come. Of course, Polyface is a unique situation because we've got a lot of eyes and hands and stuff going around. So you have to be even more careful. But... You know, situational awareness. If I'm driving up with the tractor, don't stand there. Notice that I'm going to hook up to something, come around the back, hook me up, put the pin in, be available. Um, situational awareness, very, very critical. Um, and we're, always, we're asking, did you not see that, and uh, why didn't you do something about it? Um, for us, number six is loyalty and respect. Um, and I say loyalty and respect not just to me as a boss or dad as Ooh, Joel Salatin, guru, polyface, woo, wow. But to the operation, okay? Every operation has its quirks and kinks, you know? I mean, you know, you drive the four-wheeler around the shed this way and park it because that's the way granddaddy did it and that's because the way you did it and that's the way you like it done. Just be respectful and loyal to that. And also, as you, as you raise, you know, if you have a chicken pen that looks like a Quonset hut and someone's like, oh, I think that's stupid. I never want to hear an apprentice or an intern say, Oh, I think it's stupid too. You always rally the ragging around the team and support what's going on on the farm. That's not the time and place to be um, having your own, um, you know, opinions being heard in that situation. You need to be rallying the rag wagons. We come as a team, and there are team meetings that we have. And if there are situations that you think are out of line, you bring them up in a quiet, reserved nice setting, not in front of the world, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But we don't want to be, have people uh, backstabbing us in, in the middle of it. Um, number seven is just playing get it done. We want to see hustle. We want to see just dripping sweat, hustle. I mean, we had one guy who made that. We just finished checkouts, so I'm fresh off of all this. This is really fun to do. Uh, we just finished checkouts here uh, just a week ago, I guess. Saturday. Be yeah, Saturday before we came here. And... Um, we had this one kid, and I say, boy, he wanted to win medals. We were hauling brush to the chipper. We were chipping, and he was running from the chipper to the brush pile, grabbing that brush. I mean, just everything he could grab in, that, in his hand, just dragging it up, dropping it by the chipper, running back. I mean, he was just soaked. And, you know, I understand that he can't keep that up all four months. I understand that. But for two days, man, impress me. For two days, I mean, you need to blow my socks off, Okay. For two days, anybody can do anything for two days. I mean, we had a gal from New Jersey there, um, Air Force uh, wife, her husband's in the Air Force, kind of was a little bit, I'll say, higher society, had the nails done and whatnot. But, boy, she was a trooper. She just worked out. I mean, at the end of the second morning, boy, she's like, um, I'm kind of sore. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, to be honest, I'm a little sore too. But that's all right. You know, she put out and really, really worked hard. Um, well, like I said, for two days, I want to be impressed. Um, okay, take responsibility. If I ask you, if I ask you to check out or an intern or whatever, um, you know, this has happened and it's wrong, it's incorrect, and you messed up here, don't give me a line of reasons as to why, why you did what you did. Just say, hey, I'm sorry. I messed up. You know, this is what I like to do. Uh, how, can I, how can I make this right? Just take, be quick to take responsibility. I make mistakes all the time. Just tell you know, say, hey, you know, you should have uh, not driven in the, can you see the mud there? You shouldn't have driven in the mud and got the truck stuck. 
I can do that. I can say, oh, I blew it. I drove right in the mud. My bad. And you got to get it out. So it's not a problem to mess up. Just take responsibility for it. Just don't pass the buck. Nothing will make me more upset than someone trying to pass the buck on me. Um, the last one, number nine, is must be willing. And this is one of the most important things. There is all, we call it all, everything we do at Polyface is sacred. There's no good jobs and bad jobs. There's no special work and grunt work. Everything is special from sweeping the floor to brushing down the, the um, sweep, uh, to sweeping down the chill tank or whatever, cleaning the processing shed to uh, washing dishes to um, moving the cows. It's all important. And so one of the things we have here, if you've completed all this, we really have attitude is everything. I mean, it doesn't matter experience. People put up here on the wall, uh, must have experience, all that. That's baloney. Show me a willing heart, a willing attitude, an aptitude for learning, and situational awareness. I can teach you anything. If, you have a will <laughs> if you've got a willingness to, if willingness to learn, a great attitude, and a respect and responsibility, I will teach you anything you want to know. And that's what makes the intern program rewarding. Um, so we send them home with a protocol sheet that clears up anything else. It's got time commitment, uh, the work schedule, uh, how often they're supposed to be. Our intern program, we work, um, they have to work one weekend out of three. So out of the eight, let's just say we have eight interns, we get two of them, two or three of them working every um, weekend, and they work that out themselves. I said, as long as I see two or three smiling faces out here Saturday and Sunday, I don't care who it is, <laughs> and uh, they work that out. We um, accommodations. Right now, Polyface um, <coughs> supplies um, room and board. It is the for the guys. It is a single wide trailer with bunk style housing, uh, bathroom, shower, whatnot, and a common kitchen. The girls have a small cottage, um, a little bit newer, a little bit nicer. The guys are going to get one, um, hopefully this year, working on building a, a different one. Um, and we're actually kind of something new. We found out that, that hunt camps are legal in Augusta County for non-zoning and non-building permits. So we're having the Polyface Hunt Camp, which we are, in, we are hunting for truth. And uh, so we're going to build us a Polyface Hunt Camp, and we're going to have us a, a nice intern housing, uh, hopefully for 2013. Uh, so we're excited about that. But anyway, right now it's a single wide mobile home. It's not the Taj Mahal, but I've seen everything from housing from tents on cement blocks all the way to living inside with a family. Um, I will suggest separate housing. Um, don't have them in your face all the time. You need a little bit of space, and so do they. Um, so certainly separate housing of entrance and all that is very critical. To clarify again what you provide for the females? Yes. No, what oh, well, I'm sorry. What we uh, it's a small cottage. It's it's room right now. We're set up for about six guys and two to three girls. Is kind of how we select our, our team, um, up to six guys and uh, and uh, three to two to three girls. So the accommodation there we call the the guys uh, the roost, <laughs> and uh, the girls have their little cottage and uh, it has a, again a small kitchen kitchenette if you will. Nothing not, doesn't have an oven or anything. Just a hot plate, microwave, that kind of thing. Um, and, and a bathroom shower and stuff. But they're um, eating with you for most of the their, their meals, okay, the meals are breakfast and lunch on their own. They, they make it themselves. And um, they are eating with us in the afternoon, in the evening meal. And in the summer for the intern, we actually have a staff uh, cook or chef, depending on which way you want to call it. And she provides the evening meal for the entire family and intern. So there's about 20 of us sit down for a communal family-style meal every evening, June through September. It's a really great time to ask questions and do, you know, yeah, it's, it's great. And uh, the wives don't have to cook, so that makes it even better. Um, excuse me, the chef is a paid position. Yes, ma'am, she is uh, one of the employees. Yes, exactly. Up until two years ago. Up, yeah, up, in, up, in two, up until two years ago, the moms cooked. But when we added the interns program, we upped that up. That was just too much, and so we did that. You can, and um, I'll get to that in, um, and so in compensation, we do housing for the boys and the girls. That is actually very legal. It's not, pro you can build any kind of little temporary housing because they're not putting a dress there. Uh, you can make, like again, I've seen, I've seen tents, 
and I've seen you know, temporary housing like we have, and that type of temporary housing is very legal for that type of uh, farm staff work. Um, and then we have the food. We have offering, um, they have full uh, access to our freezers. Um, no filet mignon lunches, please. Uh, so you know, we have a staff food pile of you know dent and damaged products. So you're providing food for. We provide. Lunch. We the, yes, we provide food for. I mean, if they want to go out and get, you know, okay. um, fancy yogurts or whatever, we have a milk share close by. So we have you know they offer them shares in the milk. They we, they, the guys who do the milk share understand that we have a seasonal glut of milk drinkers, and so they help us out on getting a bunch of extra milk from them, so they can buy milk if they want to make yogurt and whatnot. But if they want to get peanut butter, they go buy their own and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, all of the meat and poultry and produce that they can get from Polyface, they have free reign to it. Again, we have a staff food, kind of a scratch and dent. Um, these tomatoes are about to go use them up quick pile. <laughs> and so we have that, but it is, and, and then the dinners are completely provided. They don't have to cook at all. The compensation is um, you can either do time, money, or food. <laughs> That's kind of the way that you can you can pick. You can pick and choose. You can either pay them a bunch and work them really hard and they can go buy all their own food, uh, whether they buy it from you or whatnot, but they buy it all. You can either work them really hard, give them all their food, and fix it some for them, or you have to give them enough time off to fix their own food. Okay? You can't do a combination of thereof and still make you can't you can't knock off at 7 o'clock at night and be like, see you later, guys. I walk in. Sherry's got a beautiful five-course dinner laid out on the table for me, which, do you ever leave me a four-course dinner? Okay. No. <laughs> I'm in, in hopes of a five-course dinner laid out on the table. <laughs> and um, they have to go home and still cook their dinner and go to bed and still be ready to rise up early in the morning and rock and roll. Um, so you have, to you have to take that into account. So we did the staff dinners together. Um, so that we can all sit together, we can all just enjoy the fact that we had a great successful day and go over tomorrow's plan, etc., and enjoy the bounty of the farm um, together. And then I, I mentioned the cash already, they get $100 a month um, uh, stipend uh, just in, you know, in cash. Um, is there a limit on the amount of time? Is there a limit on the amount of time that they can be there? Per day work. Oh, per day work. Uh, no, this is a farm experience. If I'm out, they're out. Um, or and, and actually more so because I've got emails and phone calls and things like that. So I set up work after. The, and the protocol sheet address, I'll, I'll go through a little bit more on that. I have a question in the back. Yes. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask about, are you aware of there being any legal issues with how many hours you can have someone work? Um, for this type of program, again, somebody might jump up and say I'm completely wrong. And our program... I don't know of any because this is an educational program. They voluntarily submit to what we're doing. They understand what's going on to begin with. Um, we give them a complete rundown. So, yeah, the, the day work requirements, um, the work schedule, uh, I'll just read what we have in the protocol sheet. Then they take this home and read it before they agree to come. Um, Daybreak until dismissed. <laughs> uh, Generally, this is at dinner, which is dinner is at 6.30, but sometimes longer as needed. That's kind of how we handle the work schedule. You know, so if we're making hay and we just come in, grab a quick, you know, throw the bacon on the biscuit, we're burning daylight type situation, and you run back out there and keep unloading, they do that too. Um, but if, if we're done at 6.30 and we have dinner, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour, and now it's 7.30 and we're not pressing on things, there's other small jobs that they have to do. And this is the difference between an intern and an apprentice. Interns are typically done at this point. Apprentices usually have some other tasks to do. Close up the egg mobile, maybe get an order ready for tomorrow pickup, little, little small things like that that they have to do. Um, and, uh, and then they get, like, say, two out of three weekends are off, Saturday, Sunday only. Um, they can swap around is fine. And if they want any additional days off for uh, emergencies or whatnot, they're by request only directly to me. Um, so, you know, if... Your great grandmother dies and you need to go home for the funeral. We're very accommodating on that. But if you know your good buddy's throwing a party, forget it. I'm not, we're not going there. Um, I mean, it's a four-month commitment. Come on, people. Let's just get you, know, you go to the Peace Corps for two years and don't get to come home at all. So let's let's just get on board here. Um, 
You know, another thing in the, in the, thing, uh, in the protocol sheet is we're a team. We guard against cliques, special buddies that can turn into a soap opera. We've had four weddings germinate from this Aaron Tins trip, but romance has its appropriate time and expression. And then, and then Dad has a little thing. Get it? <laughs> Dad, Dad writes this. He has fun with these uh, English uh, flares here. Um, we have things, you know, what you're supposed to bring. Um, uh, you know, work clothes, rubber boots, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we provide earplugs. We provide gloves. Um, one of the things we added this year is we provide the first set and worn outs are replacement for free. Uh, lost and misplaced gloves and earplugs are not replaced for free. <laughs> Because <laughs> you got people leaving stuff around all over the time, all over the place. Uh, what else is interesting in this protocol? Uh, activities. What they're gonna, what they're gonna be doing. What we promise that we're gonna show them and teach them and, and educate them on. Anything to make po Polyface run more smoothly. Yeah, I don't guarantee that I'm gonna teach them anything as far as we are gonna learn how to set up fence. We're gonna learn how to do it. It's about what you put in. If you make Polyface run smooth, I will be able to take you out there and show you all sorts of things. If you just make problems for us, I'm not going to take you. Um, so we don't box ourselves in with saying, well, we're going to learn pond construction and key line fence design and all that because, I mean, this year we're taking over another rental farm. So this year, the intern program, we're going to go over there. We're going to be setting up fence from scratch. We're going to be putting out water line from scratch. They get to see all this farm development. If we don't take another farm over next year, next year's group won't see any of that. That's not my fault. So I don't box myself into a corner about what I'm going to teach them. Again, it says all jobs are sacred. Um, it gives a clear definition of uh, chain of command, um, who's in charge. We have an apprentice manager this year. Um, one of our stellar, stellar apprentices is coming back. We're super excited. We've done this from time to time. And they are, they, he's going to be my right hand Man, and it's going to be wonderful. He's, we've done this a couple times. It's great. And they help. He's got another buffer uh, so we can talk, and then he can disseminate information. It's going to allow us to do a lot more one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, a lot more bosses and a lot fewer workers so that we can have more interaction with people that know what's going on and have an education and more information to share. Um, here's a funny one. Just This is a polyface specific one. I'll give you this one. This is one of the last ones. Personal appearance and grooming. Polyface is not a place to make a cultural shock statement with your personal grooming habits. <laughs> our customers need to be impressed with our cleanliness and classic appearance. The all-American look earns respect, especially when you're in the food business. Everybody keep your hair clean and out of your face. Keep it like it was at your checkout and when we selected you. This, I'll talk about that in a minute. This is not the time to let yourself go. Body odor will not be tolerated. Water is plentiful and soap is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> we've, had, we've had a couple instances where we have this checkout. They know we what we like. So we got these guys, you know, nice buzz haircut. You know, shorter than mine. Mine's getting a little bit out of control, honestly. And uh, so nice haircut. They look good. They got a tan. They got real nice clothes, all this stuff. They look good. And we say it's a great economic stimulus package. All these checkouts have to go out and buy muck boots and Carhartt jackets and work gloves and all this stuff to come prepared for the checkout. And, uh, and then when they come, they've got like this long hair and a big full beard. And you're like, where did you come from? And uh, when you're dealing with chicken, it just doesn't look too good when you're sitting there. And all this stuff. Anyway, that's just a polyface funny one. If that's the way your farm looks like, go for it. You know, that's just specific to us. Um, Okay, where are we at here? Uh, questions on interns and apprentices, something I haven't covered. I'd like to spend a little bit of time on how we set up the subcontracting and work with other farmers and whatnot. Um, but I, I've, I've got about 15 more minutes or so. So yes, ma'am, in the back. Yeah, good, good. Okay, yes, laptop and electronic devices. Yes, we do. <laughs> are permitted for use in free time only. We don't let anything, uh, so no phones, texting, or earbuds during work time. You want to see my dad have an apoplectic fit, <laughs> show up in the morning and work with earbuds, and oh my goodness, he'll wrap those things around your neck and stuff them up your nose cavity. I tell you what, it nothing makes it, so we, we, we have free time, we have Wi-Fi on the farm, you're welcome to do that, but there's plenty of time to do that in your off time. Weekends are free, 
These guys don't have anything so important it can't wait for six hours. <laughs> I mean, I recommend some of them to carry phones. I carry a phone so we can get in touch with each other if need be, but don't be texting and fooling around checking your Facebook. In the back, in the purple, yes. Could you give me a on how to handle conflict? Like if you ever had to fire Okay, now everything's not all rosy. How do we deal with that? <laughs> Good question. We have only had to send about three people home, um, and here's how we deal with it. Uh, for lack of a better term, we'll initially have a come to Jesus meeting. We just bring them in and say, look, it's not working. And we have specifics. Don't just say, you're aggravating me. You have to have... <laughs> which... <laughs> which... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to have some specifics. You're driving me up the wall and down the other side because you didn't use soap and water in the last week and a half. Uh, <laughs> And believe me, we have had that meeting, okay? This is all experiences. That's why this, this is so fun. I, I love doing this. I, I hope I get to do more of these. These are so fun. Um, I hope it's beneficial for y'all. That'd be number one. But um, I enjoy talking about it. These are hilarious situations. Um, so we've had to have those type of meetings. Um, we've had to send a guy home because he was so situationally unaware, I thought he was going to injure himself. Uh, and someone else. I mean, literally, there was a couple times I had to grab him out of the way of a cow herd coming right at him, and I just get it, and it just didn't work out. Obviously, in the checkout period, we don't do everything that we typically do in the summer. So, you know, there's a little bit of crossover there that just didn't, when he came, I was like, oh man, what, what did we miss? We messed up. So, there, there are some situations there. The way we have it is we have a, a warning meeting. We say, look, you got two weeks to fix XYZ, or we're done. Okay, or it's just not going to work. Um, very calm, no you know, yelling and screaming, just here's the way we feel. Um, they have a, another, another situation on conflict is that another point on conflict is I make it clear at least once a month and certainly at the very beginning that I am an open book and I am an open door policy. They can come to me at any time. Any member of the team can come to me, Sherry, Dad, anybody, and say, any problem, and it could be anything from the fact that I quote movies too often to the fact that one of their roommates snores really loud and they can't work it out to the fact that, um, you know, the way I go to church on Sunday bothers them. I don't know. Anything they want to bring up. I'm an open book. Again, glass house. Remember I talked about that earlier? You get all of these. Um, and so I, we don't my assumption, here's a good, a good rule to live by. I assume that all's peachy and keen out in the roost unless I'm told. I don't worry about over here, over here. If you've got something to say, you need to come to me and say it. Until then, I'm going to assume everything's okay. If you're unhappy with me and you haven't told me, that's your fault, not mine. Okay? And so we handle it that way. So after we give the, the come to G2, you've got two weeks to shape up or ship out. If things, I mean, and we've had people literally on the brink of getting sent home and we do this and the next morning it's like a different person you're like what well, I mean completely different we had a guy that didn't say a word he literally he'd come in the back door and just stand there and you're like are you there He's like, do you not say anything I mean he didn't say anything and this went on for like a month they sit at the dinner table not a word nothing freak yeah freak the ladies out they're like this guy's just weird me out <laughs> like a ghost, you know, just kind of pop in and out. Yeah. We didn't even know. Like, uh, I'm sorry, Johnny, I forgot you were there. You may go now. And so, I mean, you know, so, so we said, look, you got to start talking. We just can't operate this way. <laughs> and so, and I mean, the next morning it was, good morning, Daniel. Good to see you. How's it going? What can I do for you today? Walks in. Hey, what's for dinner? What can I help? With? Like, Who was this guy? But you just have to communicate. It's bad. You can't be afraid of conflict and communication. You have to say something. They can't read your mind. And so um, we have had a, two situations there where it didn't change, it didn't work out, and then we don't do a two-week notice. We don't do any time. It's like, look, you got two days to pack your bags and hit the road. We need to, to move you on. Um, one of the biggest things is and when we talked about soap operas and stuff like that, we, get some, we, we have clicks and things like that develop. We go to them and say, look, you know, this is just not appropriate action. We need to include more of the team in what you're doing, um, and, and we, need to, we need to cease and desist some of this stuff. So most of it's petty stuff. It's mostly just kind of ridiculousness. Um, when you get a bunch of kids together, it's just that's the way it is. Um, 
But uh, good, good question. I think we had, yes. How do you feel? I mean, do you think it's important to have like regular feedback from you to the to the crew? How do like evaluations? How do I feel about evaluations with them? We don't do evaluations. I know some programs that do. Um, I think that's okay. I think it's a little formal. I'm a. I hate meetings. I hate sit down, do fill out paperwork. So part of it's just me. I hate that. I like to deal with it in the moment. You know, hey, uh, Pete, you did a great job here. You know, you did an awesome job setting all this up. Um, that, that's one thing. I did. You have to be quick at compliments. In apprenticeship program, you have to be quick at telling them they did a good job because there's a lot of times that they do screw up. And so you have to be careful about beating on them all the time and tell them when they do learn how to set up the fence the way you like it done. Um, we don't do evaluations. Uh, and part of it's just I feel like it sometimes just keeps everybody under, oh, I got an evaluation coming up this week. It's just, I think, more stress than needs to be added. So I like in the moment stuff right away. Yes, you had a question? No. I'm back. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, this uh, the protocol. Contract yes. Sign. Can you check that out legally just in case? Nobody signs the protocol. Oh. It's just a heads up. Nobody signs anything on the intern. That way I can get rid of you tomorrow if I don't like the way your hair's cut, and you can leave if you think I'm offensive. No, nobody signs this at all. Um, it, it's just a heads up. This is what we expect from you. This is what we're going to give back, and, um, and so we're all on the up and up. I guess what I'm asking is there, is there legality Is there legality to this operation? Um, I'm going to say I don't know, but I don't think so. Because, I mean, you can get fired tomorrow. Uh, I mean, is there some just cause and stuff in there? I mean, we don't fire people for no reason. It's just that um, it, it, it's, you're committing to an educational process. I mean, people drop out of school all the time. It just doesn't work for you. You do one semester and you say, I hate this professor. I'm not going back to that class. So a lot of it is just it's an educational. We look at it as an education, not a job. That's why we don't hire people. It's not a firing. So I kind of misspoke there originally. Um, it's not a firing. It's just that this relationship is not working. So you can get around a lot of that, you know, uh, fire without cause, hire equal opportunity, employment, all that stuff. I mean, we are equal opportunity. Anybody's welcome to apply. Um, but you can get around some of that stuff as far as a legal jargon um, based on, on the fact that it's an educational standpoint. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have any problems with people wanting to leave after they get, like, the front end of the education when they're actually, you know? Do we have people wanting to leave early? Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, a couple times, but we go really hard, the fact that we don't want them to be doing that, and that it's exceptionally frowned upon. I mean, they're, I mean it's not that they're shunned, but practically. I mean, if you, if you bail out two months into the program, come on, man, give me a break. Um, so they also don't leave with a poly-faced solution. What's that? They, yeah, they also don't leave with a poly-faced seal of approval on anything. You know, if we have any people calling up, say, hey, this guy put you down as a reference, I'll say don't hire him at all. I mean, if you complete the program, for us, you leave with our blessing and our, you are a great person and we're going to try to get you everywhere you want to go. And um, if they do something like that, that's just dumb. Uh, we have very few of that. We make it very clear, again, in the protocol, we commit to you for four months. You need to commit to us to four months. Again, nothing signed, but it's very clear that there's a commitment exchange um, in this situation that we that we commit to each other to do this. Uh, question here on the side. Um, yeah, how do you handle um, delegation? Do you have specific things that you normally delegate right. to people? Right. How do we handle delegation? And also, when you do delegate, um, how do you handle um, having people adjust to things or putting things without kind of putting a damper on their delegation? Right, right. Okay, how do, how do we let creativity flourish? Um, Without without having thing without having things upset the apple cart. Okay, um, good good observation. I mean, it, it's a tightrope. It's a very tightrope because we do things um, for a reason, and a lot of times it takes doing it to find out that reason, or doing it the wrong way um, to see the reason. Um, for as far as delegation goes, there are several key factors or key roles that we have them jump into right away. Obviously, one is the the broiler operation. Uh, moving pens, choring, that kind of thing, uh, butchering chickens, 
uh, that sort of thing. They also take over like turkeys, um, egg layers, all the you know the kind of chore stuff. But they get the, it's not a everybody in the team. You have to do all of this, this, and this. It's Sally, you need to do the egg collecting. George, you need to move the pens, et cetera. And so everybody's responsible. And then you're there for four months. So after two or three weeks, everybody just kind of rotates one spot to the right and everybody gets to learn everything. That's kind of the delegation process. Um, and, and certainly we check up on them you know, pretty much regularly to make sure everything's done properly and, and follow up and catch problems right away. As far as creativity, <sighs> We ask in both the handbook and the protocol that they commit to four months of just doing it our way first. Um, and we take, and that's what dinner is for. We encourage dinner to be a freewheeling, creative, flowing, nobody gets shot down. Hey, have you ever thought about running hoses to the pins or have you ever thought about doing that? And most of the stuff that they bring up, we've either tried or put a pencil to and decided that it's not good or not for us or whatever. So we let the dinner time and the free time or whatever be a freewheeling discussionary point. And there has been a lot of great ideas. I mean, we relish the outside input of the interns. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we do it is so that we can get input. I mean, they keep your feet to the fire. I mean, they, they, if you're doing something crazy, they're going to say, why are you doing this? And you got to really think about the answer. Um, and then they leave and do it their way. And so then they can leave and do it their way. So, I mean, certainly... Certainly there is some, some leeway there, um, but we ask for a lot of understanding if we're slow to just jump off the boat one direction or another and just change something. Um, but, uh, but certainly apprentices, they have a lot more leeway. Of course, subcontractors, they have leeway. Um, you know, it, we're not a dictatorship by any stretch of the imagination. We want creativity to flow, um, but that goes back to that four-month commitment thing. You know. You want to really get involved here, let's let's be committed to it. Maybe one more question that I really want to talk about some subcontracting. Yes? Do you specifically make time for teaching? Or hmm. or How do we teach? Do we actually sit down and do lecture time and teaching time, or is it all just work time? Um, the answer is yes. We promise we do a couple lectures over the summer, like maybe four or five. Dad does a couple. Um, Sherry does one, I do one, and we'll do some lectures after dinner and we'll talk about specific topics that they as a consensus have asked us to address. It could be anything from the business flow of a broiler plan to how we set up a farm. Uh, I did cow days this morning in a, in a lecture. That's a typical one that we do right away to help them understand cow days and grass management and that kind of thing. Um, the rest of it... <sighs> We do very, we very specifically go out to a field and we're doing a new project. Let's say we're going to move a pen. Day one, they arrive, June 1st. Okay, we're here, eight people, let's go. We'll walk out to the field and say, okay, let's do broiler chores. And they'll follow me, we'll do broiler chores, them just observing and doing it. And we'll say, okay, here's how you move the pen. Okay, James, you step up here, you move a pen. All right, Sally, you step, you move a pen. And we just go up through. Most of the nice thing is that a lot of the stuff we do in the summertime is repetitive. So you just go down the line, everybody gets a chance to do it. Um, and then after that, they're free to do it, and then I'll come by you know, a week later and say, okay, James, um, you kind of developed a bad habit here on putting the dolly under. We need to tweak this a little bit to get you a little more efficient, et cetera. I mean, we want them to be able to leave and be completely effective at doing a broiler operation or a layer operation or whatever. Um, so we critique that way. So it's kind of a balance. I'll take one more. You got a question. Have you ever had interns that are from the neighborhood or live off the farm? Do we have ever have we ever had interns that live off the farm? Um, yes, we actually when we first started, all of the interns lived off the farm because we didn't have housing. Um, did you pay them the same, or you paid them a little? How did we pay them? How was the compensation handled? Um, we didn't pay them any different. Um, you know, if you want to live on the student dorms, you can live there, or you can live off site at the frat house. I mean, yeah, that we kind of look at it as again as an education. It's very much a college setting, and you can commute to be here, but they had to be there at the same time as everybody else, and, and that was a choice. Uh, you know, again, up front, here's the commitment, here's what you're going to get, and, and it worked out. Now, certainly, from that group, we heard very quickly, we would really love to be on farm because that's when things happen. Inevitably, as soon as they left, something cool would happen. They'd be like, oh, no, I missed it. You know, cow had her calf, shoot. I can't believe I missed it. And so we knew we had to quickly move to on-site housing. Yeah, but... Um, it's certainly not out of the question, and um, 
I mean, you know, if you're in a rental situation, you know, maybe you decide to do some rental or something like that, and you might want to pay for that. It might be a way for you to bury some on-farm income in, you know, that type of compensation. Um, that, that would be certainly specific to your operation. Okay? Um, a quick look at, op at, um, at subcontracting. I've only got like five minutes, but this, is, this will be very brief. Um, when we work with the subcontractors, we just create a memorandum of understanding. We have had this looked at by some, by some legal stuff, uh, legal folks. And so we, we just create a memorandum of understanding. Um, we have a clear role of the worker and what they're going to be doing, the manager. We call them the, the farm manager on the farm. Um, and the clear role of the company, which is Polyface. So if the company is supposed to provide the pens and the feed and the broilers and all of this, whatever that commitment is, we put all that down. And if they're committed to move feed and water and service and do all that, we put that down. Okay, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, any other in-kind gifts, whether we're paying the rent for their housing or whether they're paying it or, you know, whatnot. We just kind of just rough out a rough agreement, okay? We put down um, that... <coughs> We both agree to um, any differences are settled by arbitration, not litigation. Uh, we agree just not to sue each other. Um, this memorandum is signed, so we do have that looked over. And the other thing that we went to um, is an early termination clause. That's back to your four-month thing. Um, we have, if they decide, if, especially in this, because they're raising, I mean, they're raising chickens. They've got, some of them have like 1,800 layers. They've got 2,000 broilers. They've got some pigs. And who knows what their operation looks like? But it's fairly substantial because they're trying to earn a complete income. These guys are, are looking at getting married, having children, living a family, doing an actual full business. Um, we've put in an early termination clause. T typically, we update these annually. Um, these memorandum of understanding, we update them annually. And if, if for any reason they decide I'm out of here earlier than that termination date, um, they owe us a lot of money <laughs> um, because it's a big investment for us to try to take that farm over midstream. Um, and I say a lot, meaning like 10,000 or more um, on some of the farms, depending on the size of the operation, the distance away from the farm and such. Just a little trick that we use. It just seems to be the easiest thing um, just to get everybody on the same page. We haven't, um, since we've added that, we haven't had any problem with people leaving or anything like that. And, and again, if we sit down at the table, they're hating it. It's not working for us. We can skip that, but they can't just come to us and say, hey, we're unhappy. We have a job offer in California. It's going to pay me 200 k I'm out of here. That's not going to cut it. You say, okay, fine. Then pay me 15, 20 grand. Yes, in the back. Are you uh We, on, on the product flow, uh, it works several ways. We've done it both. Uh, it depends on the product. Like when they raise broilers, yeah, we guarantee purchase um, on like, say, if they wanted to raise some sheep or something and some side thing, we don't guarantee that, but we're happy to try to sell it for them. Um, so we do a little bit of both. But that's also spelled out in there as well. Um, or, or some type of, um, you know, Share. yeah, shares of some sort. But typically, it's a, it's a guarantee. And, uh, and we set it pretty low so that we don't get in trouble. Yes? Is there a tax incentive? Do we set it up this way versus the salary? Oh, absolutely. Subcontracting is much more uh, better for taxes because then we pay them. They, they're in charge of, uh, you can look into subcontracting. But for Polyface, it's a much better tax incentive to have a subcontractor than an employee. How is it on their end? It works pretty good. They usually set up an LLC of some sort or, a, or some sort of corp, and we actually write the check to like Powers Farm or you know wherever, and then they they can pay themselves. It works out pretty well for them as well. Okay, let's see. There, uh, yeah, go ahead. Is there a difference between an independent contractor and a subcontractor? Uh, I'm not going to answer that. I don't know. I, I will admit that I don't know. Yes, you're good. So, so typically, the kind of the basis of the relationship is they're doing the producing, and you guys take care of the marketing. Typically, our subcontracting is we're handling the marketing. It's sold through the Polyface umbrella, um, just because that's the, in our area. That's a name recognition. It helps. We can move things along, and we can expand. But again, the subcontracting we only do it on farms that we currently rent. So they're close by, and we only do it with people that we've already worked with. So it's a very, very small, controlled um, situation. In the back. What's your tax? Are you an LLC? Um, we are a, we are incorporated, actually. Polyface is actually a, a incorporated, um, I guess a C-Corp, I believe. And so we have employees, 
the, the whole the company takes care of our health insurance, our pay, our withholding, all of that. And we just, you know, we're, we're a salaried, salatins, myself, are a salaried position to polyphase. Yeah, absolutely. And same with the other contractors and whatnot. They're under polyphase. Yeah, good question. I had a question over here. Maybe one more, and then we're going to have to shut it down. Yes, sir. I'm not sure if you answered this question at the outset, but what do you see uh, as being the, the overarching benefit of polyphase to do uh, interns and apprentices as compared to Okay, what's the benefit to do an intern to Polyface or your business? The big thing for us that we see is that it allows you to have, A, an extended um, uh, interview process if you're looking to move toward employees. It, for, for Polyface, I'm going to speak for Polyface in general, and then I'll speak for everyone else, uh, I think. For Polyface in general, we look at it as a four-month um, interview process that if they decide to be more involved with Polyface, we'll, uh, I'd say, well, it's a four-month interview process, whether they want to be more involved with Polyface or we want them to be more involved with Polyface. It's a two-way street. Um, so for us, a successful internship is that they know enough to do things. They can either go out, be involved in agriculture somewhere else. They don't have to be involved with agriculture. I mean, the stuff that we teach here is not all about food and farming. They can go be successful uh, house builder or whatever. So we, just because they don't farm, we don't feel like we failed. Um, you know, just because you don't end up marrying your first date that you ever went on doesn't mean that it was a bad idea. <laughs> if, you do, if you break up after one date, this actually might be a successful situation. Um, so that's what the internship program is for us. And we're wanting to send out farmers to go all across the world. Because actually, the Polyface motto is to develop environmentally and ecologically enhancing agriculture paradigms and duplicate them throughout the world. It's not actually to get big and sell lots of food and all that. That's just a byproduct. So any way that we can, that's why I'm here today. That's why Dad goes and speaks. That's why we write. That's why we do things. Because we're, we're, we want to change the world. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to teach them hands-on, on-the-ground intern program. Um, so, and it's really exciting to have that injection of young people that are gung-ho, excited about farming every year. I mean, that, that's one of the biggest benefits is they come, I mean, the, the guy, we just, I mean, we just sent out our emails, our accepting emails to people. And uh, so we're getting our uh, emails coming back saying, yeah, I made it and all this stuff. And they are so excited to farm. They can't, they can't wait. We've got this guy, he made the trailer for Spider-Man 2. Okay, and he's going to come be an intern at Polyface. I'm like, dude, you really want to come? I mean, he made the trailer for the new Sherlock Holmes movie. That's what he does. The honors uh, program for the uh, Super Bowl coming up uh, in tomorrow or whenever it is, Sunday, he developed that. I'm like, and you want to come be? He's like, I am sick and tired of the rat race. I've got to get out of Hollywood. He said, I've enjoyed my career. It's been wonderful. He's 40, he's uh, 39, 40, 45. He's like, I got to get out. I'm done with it. I got to get out and learn how to farm. And everything we did, he just, he just could not be more excited. He, everything, he's like, you mean I get to gather eggs? You mean I get to drive a tractor? Are you kidding me? He was just jumping up and down. And so that excitement, okay, that excitement injected into the farm just does wonders for you as a farmer. I mean, I can tell just from my standpoint, every year having these guys going, Wow, I got to see a calf being born. Wow, I put this cow into the you know, corral by myself. I caught the chickens. I killed these birds. I'm eating something I raised. That, that, uh, that new, ever-fresh excitement that they bring to the farm, for someone who is doing it day after day after day, like the owners, <laughs> um, it, you can't put a price tag on it. 